All right. Well, are you ready to uh, dive into session two? This session is called Turning Vision into Action. So kind of get yourself prepared for that. And I'll say a quick word of prayer for me, if not you. And then we'll jump in. Father in heaven, when we think about all the energy that gets created by a vision that honors you, you know, it really sets our hearts soaring. But now, God, we need to figure out how to convert all that energy into the kind of action that gets visions done. And we look to your Holy Spirit to be the teacher in this session, for Christ's sake. Amen. You know, there's really only one thing more exciting than clarifying and casting a God-honoring vision, and that's achieving the vision, actualizing the passion-producing picture that you and your people have dreamed about and prayed about and strived for, you know, kind of finally entering the promised land that you've been walking toward all those years. Now, we all know that in church work, the journey can be wonderful. You know how we always say that? The journey can be wonderful. But take this to the bank. It's only going to stay wonderful if it's leading toward an achievable destination. I've never known a leader who could keep the vision hot and the team fired up indefinitely without being able to say, hey, troops, we're making some progress. That dream that we were dreaming, that prayer that we were praying, that picture that fired us, fired us up so, well, we're becoming who we dreamed we would become. We're doing what we said we would do. We're bearing the fruit we, we hoped and prayed we would bear. So now let's keep going. We'll make it someday. We're in route. But without some progress to point to, the leader is one day going to be forced to face the inevitable question that someone on the team is going to pose. Oh, great visionary one, when might we get some indication that we're getting closer to the destination? Are we more than just dreamers? Are we really ever going to turn this vision into reality? And that question presents the leader with a defining moment opportunity, an opportunity to move beyond the vision-casting phase of leadership into the implementation phase of leadership, or if you like the cruder way of saying it, the getting it done phase of leadership. Now, I'm going to pull the curtain back on an embarrassing reality about leaders. A fairly high percentage of leaders are really more into vision than they are the getting the vision done. Large numbers of visionary leaders fall into a faulty thinking pattern that says the way to get a vision achieved is to merely cast vision and then pour increasing amounts of vision and inspiration into the equation. Keep talking about the dream, keep people thinking about the dream and praying about the dream, keep people focused on the dream and pumped up about the dream, hoping against hope that one bright morning everybody is going to awaken to find the entire vision actualized before their eyes. Voila, mission accomplished. It doesn't work that way, friends. Vision achievement requires a lot more than pep talks, slogans, emotional stories, and slide presentations. It's taken me the better part of 25 years to figure out what I'm going to say to you in the next moments, but I'm getting it clearer and clearer now. There's a big difference between vision casting, visionary leadership, and getting it done leadership. Huge difference. Now to explain it, let me tell you the first of what will probably be many sailing stories. Last summer, I had the sailing opportunity of a lifetime. A businessman friend of mine allowed me to enter his half million dollar sailboat uh, in a regatta against seven other identical yachts crewed by some of the best sailors in the world. I took my regular crew off my much smaller and less expensive sailboat and I added some additional players and the day before the regatta started we went out to practice. And I sat the crew down and I told them that we were probably never ever again going to get an opportunity like this in our lifetimes. I reminded them that several of our competitors were from America's Cup boats 
And they had highly paid helmsmen and tacticians, and every boat we could put behind us in any one of the seven races would be a tremendous moral victory for us. And I gave a pretty good pep talk that day. And then we headed out into Lake Michigan to get used to the boat. None of us had ever sailed on a boat that sophisticated or expensive before. And after a little upwind work, which we did pretty well at, we decided to launch the huge spinnaker and try some jibes with the spinnaker uh, filled with ample wind. When we hoisted this huge sail that billows out over the front, uh, the wind caught it, and we started surging down some of the larger waves. It was quite blustery that day on Lake Michigan, and I'm telling you, the crew went nuts. They were all high-fiving each other, talking about how they were going to kick the posteriors of these America's Cup guys and all. Confidence was not our problem at that point. <laughs> well, then we attempted to jibe that huge spinnaker from one side of the boat to the other. And without getting too technical, this involves a complex timing sequence and perfect coordination by all 13 crew. I mean, you have to rotate this huge sail, and all these different functions have to happen in precisely the right order for this to happen well. Well, our first jibe did not go well. We got halfway through and everything fouled up. The second one didn't go well, nor the third, nor the fourth, nor the tenth, nor the twentieth. And when we ended practice that day, we had not completed a single race-worthy jibe. This was of great concern to me. <laughs> the next morning was when the formal racing started. We went out to try to get a little practice in before the first gun. Now, I had a very important leadership decision to make. I had the option of giving another vision talk. Pep them up, psych them up. Say, let's go out and beat those America's Cup guys. I could pour more motivational fuel on their fires, or I could take an entirely different approach. And I chose to do the latter. I gathered the crew together, and I said, no pep talk this morning. I think we all know that this is the opportunity of a lifetime. I don't think many of us lack energy or I don't think any of us here is unmotivated. What we have to do in this brief practice is we have to learn how to execute a few maneuvers. So we're going to sit down and we're going to talk through, before we even leave the slip, we're going to talk through who is doing what on the jibes, how we can work together better, how we can all get on the same page. If we don't do that, we can kiss this regatta goodbye, and I, for one, am not prepared to do that before the first gun of the first race. Then I asked the best sailor on our team, someone who's much, much better than I am, I asked the best sailor on our team to do something with the crew that these guys had not been subjected to since they were little kids. I asked this guy to walk through with the rest of the crew the spinnaker jibing sequence without even putting the sail up. So here we are in a half million dollar race boat in the slip next to these America Cup people, and I have my guy say to the rest of the crew, this is a spinnaker pole. This is the spinnaker sheet. This is the four guy, this is the guy. This is the topping lift, et cetera, et cetera. Said, so now when we jive from this side to that side, here's the sequence. He walked everybody through all the parts of the sequence. He did it repeatedly until we had the maneuver down cold. Then we left the slip, we went out, we hoisted the spinnaker, and we called for a real jive. And we executed it perfectly. And morale went through the roof. Then we did another and another, long story short, throughout the entire regatta, we never missed a spinnaker jive. We didn't do very well in the regatta. <laughs> These people who do America's Cup, they're good. <laughs> but the reason we improved dramatically, and we did put several boats behind us, by the way. Um, one, actually. <laughs> in one race. I uh, know, we did a little better than that, but uh, no miracle stories here. Uh, the reason we improved so dramatically is that I offered something to our crew more than just vision, something more than a higher-pitched pep talk. I offered a more advanced form of leadership, the getting-it-done form of leadership. And in this session, when we're talking about vision becoming reality, we got to shift into this more advanced stage of leadership, and as awkward as it is to talk about, and it doesn't have the sex appeal and the sizzle and the energy that a vision talk does, we got to learn about this. Because once you have a God-honoring, clearly communicated vision out in front of your people, the challenge is to get everybody working together to get it done, step by step, week by week, month by month, year by year. And this is no small challenge. 
This is what has been on the forefront of my leadership learning curve for the last two or three years. And the best way I know how to teach you about this advanced phase of leadership is to walk you through what we've learned around Willow here the last few years. Let me be quick to say, our learning curve is still very high. We're still making messes. We're still figuring some of this stuff out. We're making our share of mistakes. This is a work in progress. But I want to talk you through something we're learning. About three years ago, we had our 20th anniversary at the United Center. And I knew around that occasion that somehow an era of sorts was coming to an end. I had an intuitive sense that moving into the future was going to require a higher level of leadership from me and a more complex, multifaceted form of leadership than I had ever provided for this church. Willow had become so different over 20 years. It was so much more complex now and far-reaching. Somehow it seemed to me that our vision needed to be sharpened. Our focus had to be refined. Our staff needed clearer marching orders. So about this time, we embarked on a serious strategic planning process. Confession. I had never done a strategic planning process. Not in my business days before ministry, not in youth ministry days, not in the first 20 years of Willow. Not a serious strategic planning exercise. I knew it had to be done, but I didn't know how to do it, didn't feel capable of leading the process, so I leaned very heavily on one of our senior staff members. It's our executive pastor, Greg Hawkins, who has a lot of experience in this area. He, with some help from some other people, kind of led us in this. Of course, we had to start by looking at the main thing. Whenever you do strategic planning, it always, you say, what are we about? What are we trying to do? After scores of meetings, many months with staff, board, elders, and leading lay leaders, we decided that we needed to continue the main thing, you know, the, the, that overarching vision that we've had for 20 years around Willow, turning irreligious people into fully devoted followers of Christ. But we thought that the core of our church... Not necessarily everybody in the concentric circles around Willow, but we felt the core of our church was now sophisticated enough to understand a bit of nuance. So with a great deal of effort, we decided to refine our vision, particularly for internal leadership purposes, and we decided to talk about three manifestations of our broad vision. And we put it this way. We said, under the umbrella of turning irreligious people into fully devoted followers of Christ, for the next five years, here's what we're going to really focus on under that umbrella. Reaching a higher percentage of the Chicagoland area with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's just underlining. We're going to really still mean business about turning irreligious people into Christians. So the way we said is we're going to reach a higher percentage of the Chicagoland area with the gospel. And then the second emphasis, we said, we're going to mature our congregation with regard to the value of community, spiritual maturity, and full participation in the life of the church. You know, what does it mean to become a fully devoted follower of Christ? Well, it means, the way we were being led to describe it, it means having a higher value of community, small group involvement, spiritual maturity, full participation in the church. And then the third emphasis, we said, we want to invest more of ourselves, our knowledge, and our resources outside the walls of Willow through our extension ministries and through the Willow Creek Association. It took us many months endless hours of discussion to come to agreement on this. But we said, you know, this makes sense. The earlier years of Willow, we got along just fine with that broad uh, mission statement, that main thing, turning irreligious people into fully devoted followers of Christ. But when we pushed ourselves to add greater definition, more strategic focus about achieving that vision, then, you know, th that that reaching a higher percentage and maturing our church and investing more of ourselves outside the walls, I mean, then that started to say, yes, that's the refinement. That's the clearer focus that our church needs right now. So we wrote that all down and we said, there, we did it, didn't we? I mean, now we're not just talking about broad vision. Now we've refined our vision. And I said, you know, I'll cast it before the congregation passionately and hopefully they'll respond and then we've done our job, right? But the answer was no, we had not completed our job yet. We felt the Spirit of God prompting us to keep going, to stay with the strategic planning process, which led to a discussion about setting goals in conjunction with the strategic plan. Confession again. First 20 years of Willow, we really never had any goals. No clearly marked goals. Uh, we had a vision 
We pretty much stayed focused on it. God had brought plenty of fruit out of it. So why mess with goals? The more we thought about it, the more we prayed about it, we said to ourselves, you know, goals could probably help us establish what kind of church we'll be by the end of this five-year plan. You know, we were going to focus on evangelism, maturing our congregation, investing more of ourselves outside the walls of Willow, but how much energy should we put into each of those objectives? What percentage of our resources should go to which? What's going to keep us a biblically balanced church as we move into the future? Because a lot of churches are not biblically balanced. A lot of churches are just, you know, nuts about evangelism. But it's great. They just don't disciple anybody. Or some churches are great in discipling the already convinced. They just don't do evangelism. And some people do evangelism and discipleship, but they don't care for the poor. They don't meet the needs of, of an aching world. And we said, you know, we want to be a balanced fully orbed, biblically functioning community, Acts 2 style church. How will we know if we're making progress toward this balanced, biblically functioning community unless we establish some mile markers that will help us chart our progress along the way over the five years? So, for the first time in 20 years, we thought and we prayed and we wrestled in leadership circles until we came up with six goals that corresponded to the strategic emphasis that we were making. And they were big goals. Jim Collins, in his book, Built to Last, talks about BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals. Goals that would necessitate the activity of God. Goals that would put us on our knees and say, unless God builds the house, I mean, unless there's a supernatural infusion, we're never going to make it. And really, we thought and prayed and wrestled with this, and I'll just explain what our goals are. It'll help for illustration purposes. We said under that first strategic focus of reaching more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we said we'd like our weekend services to move from an attendance of about 15,000 over a five-year period of time to 20,000. And then we said we would, I mean, we thought that it kind of optimizes the seats that we have and the number of services we're in and so. And then we said in terms of maturing our congregation, uh, we had about 8,000 people in small groups when, when we started this all out. And we said, we'd like to move. If we have 20,000 people around here on the weekends, oh, we'd like to invite all 20,000 into small groups. Wouldn't it be great if everyone hanging around Willow, seeker and believer alike, could find community? So we set a goal of having 20,000 people in small groups at the end of the five-year period. And we wanted to grow our people up in knowledge and in worship. We wanted to mature them in, in their spiritual formation. And one way to gauge that is by our midweek service, where they come to worship and learn more. You, many of you experienced it last night or will tonight. So we were running about 4,000 at the time at New Community, and we said we'd like to move that to 8,000, which fills the auditorium twice, Wednesday and Thursday. And then we were just reviewing or redoing our membership at the time, and we said we'd like to go from just very few members, because we had just canceled everybody out and started over. We'd like to go all the way up. Yeah, that was a feat as well. Uh, we'd like to go up to 8,000 members. If we had 8,000 attenders of the new community and 8,000 full participating members of the church, we thought that'd be pretty cool. And then we said, okay, in terms of investing ourselves more on the outside, we had never kept track of how many of our people, get this, we had never kept track of how many of our people love Christ enough to serve the poor. We had never tracked in any way how many people were working with Habitat or partnering with our ministry partners downtown or going to the Dominican Republic and serving the poor down there in Mexico and other places we are. We just never even kept any data, set any goals on that. We said, you know what, you know it would be great. And we set one goal and we had to readjust it for internal purposes. But we said, we'd like to have 4,000 of our people annually working with the poor. One of the signs of a, a healthy church is a heart for the poor. And then with Jim Miato and his effort with the Willow Creek Association, we'd like to touch about 6,000, have 6,000 churches in the association after a five-year period of time. Now, when we put all these goals together, friends, I gotta tell you, it drove us to our knees. We looked at those goals and we said, oh boy, these are challenging goals. And yet we, we were nervous but sort of excited about them. And then we decided to take it a step further. We looked around our senior leadership circles and we said, who among us would like to become a goal champion? Who is willing to commit the next five years of his or her life toward the achievement, toward providing leadership, 
championship leadership toward the achievement of each of these goals. And one by one, senior leaders stepped up. Lee Strobel said, I have a heart that beats for evangelism. I would like to provide leadership in the church. I'll, I'll try to pump vision and leadership into all the areas of the church to raise the evangelistic temperature until someday we have 20,000 people at our weekend services here in the gospel. Russ Robinson took the small group's goal and other people took, John Ortberg took the new community goal and we shared these goals. And pretty soon we had these six goals and we had six gold champions. And after we did that, excitement began to build in our hearts. I remember saying to our senior leaders one night, can you imagine what Willow will be like five years from now if by God's power and through our rolling up our sleeves, we reach these goals? We will be a thriving, growing, deepening, balanced, biblically functioning community of faith, the likes of which I haven't seen too often. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be a part of an adventure like this? Can, can you sense the smile of God on these plans and dreams? And everybody said, yes. Let's get on with it. So now we had this refined vision, and we had clear goals, these big, hairy, audacious goals, and we had gold champions saying, you know, we'll give five years of our lives to move the church toward the achievement of these goals. So we said, let's go, and we did. We launched the strategic plan in January of 1996, and I spelled it all out to the congregation. When I explained it all, you could feel the temperature starting to rise, and people were saying, let the adventure begin, let's go, count me in, I'll do my part. And in a way, it felt like we were relaunching Willow, just like the theater days. As the months unfolded, I was delighted at the effect that our refined vision statement was having, and I quickly became a major proponent of goals and measuring progress. We broke down our five-year goals into 12-month goals, and we started keeping track of our progress. But about a year into it, we could see, yes, we were right on plan with some of our goals, and we could do some yay gods about that, and we did. We could also tell that we were falling behind plan in some other areas. And that brought out some fantastic discussions at our leadership meetings. Instead of sort of looking sheepishly around the circle at one another at our weekly management team meetings saying, I think we're doing pretty good, I mean, I think we're doing good enough. I think we're doing better than some other churches around the world. Uh, some of our gold champions would come to the meeting and they would say, hey, wake up. We are not doing good. We're behind plan. We're in trouble with the goal I'm responsible for. There's no way we're going to turn things around unless everybody, all of us put our heads together and we start praying more and planning and problem solving. We've got to get back on plan. I remember one day one of the gold champions said, look, I believe in this goal. I'm giving five years of my life to it. My name is behind it. We have the potential with the strength of God to achieve this goal, but we've got to address it. We've got to wake up. We've got to get to work on this. All hands on deck. It had been years since that kind of energy level had been released around the leadership circles at Willow. And I loved it. I stoked it. You know, I fanned it. The management team kicked into a whole nother level of leadership. We quickly covenanted to make sure that we were going to do everything in our power and pray for all of heaven's power to make sure that all six goals were being achieved simultaneously, that we're staying on plan for all six of these goals. We made sure that all six of these goal champions were going to have access to the, to the top leaders and resources of the church. The elders start giving their input and tracking our progress prayerfully and discerningly. The board of directors start discussing how they could provide dollars and facilities and equipment and other resources to help us achieve the six goals. I could feel a pulling together like I had rarely experienced in church leadership before. We had a synergistic energy developing. And I thought, man, we're rolling. This is fun. We have a refined vision. We've got clear goals, goal champions. We've got rising energy levels, determination, and faith. I thought, leadership... That, that's probably all we're going to have to do. Leadership probably isn't any more complex than this. I was wrong again. About 16 months into this five-year plan, I started feeling an uneasiness that was very difficult for me to put into words. When I would try to explain it to the management team or the board or the elders, I would try to sort out by my uneasiness by saying, you know, somehow it seems we're still not hitting on all eight cylinders. Maybe we're hitting on four or five, but we're not hitting on eight. There's still another piece to this puzzle. We're not all on the same page. And they would say, Bill, who isn't? What isn't firing right? 
And I'd say, I'm not sure. But if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to figure this out. And I'm going to ask you to be thinking about it, or we'll figure it out together. I have to be honest, friends, this was a stressful period for all of us in senior leadership at Willow. I mean, I was a gadfly. I kept poking around, and I got the eye roll back, you know, of people going, here he goes again. But it just seemed to me that there was a missing piece to this deal. Then one night in my kitchen at my house, I had an awakening. Um, my college-aged daughter, she just graduated from college, but this was a while back. She was a senior, as I recall. But Shauna had come home from college and invited five or six of her friends over for dinner and fellowship at our house. So I'm standing in the kitchen talking to Shauna and her friends, and one of them started telling me that she had come to Christ through our high school ministry here at Willow called Student Impact. Now, I have enormous respect for Student Impact. My kids have been immeasurably helped uh, through the ministry of Student Impact. Um, so, but this gal, a friend of my daughter, saying, yep, I became a Christian at Student Impact. She told me she was attending a college out east. I said, well, where do you go to church out there? She said, well, I don't go to church out there. And then I expected her to say, you know, after being a part of Willow, sometimes it's hard to settle in elsewhere in a traditional church or something like that. But she didn't say that. So I said, well, after being a part of Willow, it's probably kind of hard for you to go out and, you know, <laughs> settle into another church. And she said, oh, I was never a part of Willow. To which I said, well, what church did you attend while you were in high school then? And she said, I never went to church. I said, time out. <laughs> you said that you were a part of Student Impact for four years. And she said, I was. I found Christ there. I was discipled there. learned to serve there. I just never knew or heard anything much about Willow Creek Church. And a light went on in my head. I started thinking of other sub-ministries all throughout Willow who over the years gradually have become so focused on building their individual sub-ministries that they were barely connected at all to Willow Creek Community Church. And I started remembering recent conversations with staff members, paid staff members here at Willow in the hallways around Willow here, who when they saw me in the hallway, they would say, how is Willow doing with its strategic plan? And I remember my unspoken reflexive response. I didn't say it out loud, but I remember thinking, why are you asking me about how Willow is doing? Aren't you a part of Willow? Why are you asking me how we, you know, Willow and I are doing with our goals? Aren't Willow's goals your goals? And then the Dutchman in me just wanted to take over. I wanted to say, who pays your salary? You know, who provides you with support staff and ministry and budgets and buildings and sounds and lights and all that? Can we take a wild guess who does that? <laughs> Might it be Willow? <laughs> and the more I thought about all this, the clearer it became to me. Over the years, some things had changed. Without our consciously being aware of it, Willow had inadvertently evolved from a close-knit, tightly-led, single-identity, biblically-functioning community into a decentralized, multi-identity, loosely-led federation of sub-ministries. We had large percentages of staff who identified almost exclusively with the department they were working with rather than with our church as a whole. And when I started understanding all this, I told our leadership teams, we need more than a refined vision statement, clear goals, and goal champions to achieve the full redemptive potential of this church. We need to connect every full and part-time staff member directly to our strategic plan, and we need to retrain everybody to feel responsible for the future of our church as a whole, not just for their little department. I think that's the missing piece. I think that's not why we're not off, that's not why we're not firing on all eight cylinders. Once again, Greg Hawkins, other members of our executive leadership team, I mean, right there, they're like, you're right, we agree. And, and I'm making it sound like, you know, I'm, I'm, 
I mean, I'm, I, uh, I'm making it sound like this was more of me. This, a lot of this came as a team thing. I think I was just more the gadfly to push the discussion. But this was a shared thing, believe me. Um, but anyway, I said, you know, what we've got to do is a version of what my sailing buddy did with our sailboat racing team when we couldn't jive the spinnaker. We've got to go back to the basics. We have to go back to the staff, and we've got to say, this is a church. <laughs> a single identity, biblically functioning community. This is a church. We're not a constellation of just, you know, revolving planets barely connected to Mother Earth here. Uh, here is what Acts 2 says. Here's what it means to have an identity as a church. Here's what it means to develop a radiant, flourishing bride of Christ. And I said, we're going to have to invite everybody to participate in this alignment exercise so that all of us in leadership at Willow Creek are on the same page, going in the same direction, pursuing the same goals. Because if we don't pull all of this together, the health of Willow is going to deteriorate. Eventually, it could wither and die. And we cannot let that happen. Now, moment of honesty. I wish I could say that this staff alignment effort came off without a hitch. It didn't. Some staff who had operated with enormous independence for a decade or more weren't too keen about being asked to modify their sub-ministry plans to include sharing the challenge of who Willow Creek was becoming as a whole. Some felt that we were changing the rules in the, in the middle of the game. And you know what? I had to admit, in a way, we were. For many years, we had just hired staff and given them budgets and said, go build a single adult ministry, build a youth ministry, build a music ministry, build a this, build a, have fun. And they were having a ball. But many of them were headed in different directions. And when we said, now it's time to come back in and let's all be concerned and share a piece of what it means to build the whole church, well, some cried foul and they had a point. Other staff were really receptive and they jumped on board as soon as we invited them. But truth be told, it was a long, bumpy road, longer and bumpier than I thought it was going to be. We had decentralized a lot further than I had thought. It took many months and lots of meetings and tons of discussion to help everybody see that a federation of sub-ministry approach was not biblical and it was not sustainable over the long haul. In fact, in one staff meeting, I even had to resort to using a Jack Welsh quote. He's the crusty, hard-nosed CEO of General Electric who once said of leadership, Sometimes you can't behave in a calm, rational manner. You have to go out on the lunatic fringe. <laughs> I used that quote. At a critical point in the staff realignment process, after months of talk, I finally said to the staff, I'm done being cool and collected about this alignment process. The whole future of Willow is hanging in the balance. We are going to align ourselves with the God-anointed strategic plan of this church. Do you understand my resolve? The, the exit doors are clearly marked at the back of the room for anybody who feels disinclined to get on board. Use them. See? Now, obviously, those are senior pastors clapping. Um, let me say something to you heavy-handed senior pastors. Whenever a leader resorts to ultimatums, it's dangerous business. It's very dangerous business. In fact, most of the time when you resort to ultimatums, uh, it's a result of having done poor leadership up to that point. But from time to time, there must be a line drawn in the sand. There's, there comes a time when you've processed something into oblivion, and you say, now we're drawing the line. And so at a certain point in time in the process, I said to the staff, I'm not asking you for your begrudging participation in this new alignment thing. I'm asking for 110% commitment to pray and to work and to serve toward the realization of this plan that God has directed the leaders of this church to try to achieve for his glory. It's 110% time. If you can't give it or won't give it, don't let the door hit you on the way out. But we cannot 
move into the future unless all of us are together. That was the day some staff stopped carrying pictures of me in their wallet. <laughs> but for the next few months, and again, I have to give Greg Hawkins enormous credit, and Russ Robinson and Dick Anderson and others on our executive leadership team. These people pulled together and redirected every person, every position, every department in this church to reflect our total commitment to vision achievement. This was one of the most complex Herculean challenges I've ever seen in a church leadership environment. But we stuck to it with relentless resolve. And these days, for the first time in the history of Willow, the student ministries department and the programming department and the single adult ministries and the promised land ministry and the sports ministry and the couples ministries, they are all stakeholders in the overall church and they're carrying responsibility for helping the church reach its strategic plan. Every department of the church is taking responsibility for raising the evangelistic temperature so that we'll fill our weekend services with seekers who are coming to Christ. Every department of the church is raising the value of community and trying to draw people into small groups. Every department of the church is challenging people to come to the new community and to become members of the church and to serve the poor and to serve churches around the world. And for the first time, I mean, we're see, seeing a coming together and a kind of uh, teamwork that I don't think I thought was possible. Um, for the first time, we're, we're bringing every department in before the entire management team and elder and board representatives two times a year for formal presentations for how they're progressing, not just with their departmental goals, but how they're progressing with helping the overall church attain its goals. And we just finished a round of those reports in June. And uh, the only word I can use to describe those meetings when we concluded all, I mean, it was three days of meetings, very intense. The only word that I can use to describe it was exhilarating. After 23 years of leading this church, I felt like we were finally close to firing on all eight cylinders. Two decades of trying to get the vision right and finally a five-year strategic plan, goals, goals, champions, and then alignment exercises and these evaluation processes. And we've seen a, a, a turnaround in staff morale who are now excited because they're stakeholders, not just in their department, but in this overall miraculous pride of Christ thing called Willow Creek. And I went home from work after those um, management team meetings when all the staff was reporting. And I was, in, I was adrenalized in ways I have never been before. When the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 that things in the church should be done decently and in order, I could finally read that verse without a guilty conscience because I felt, you know what? I think we're making progress now. We're finally doing some decent leadership around here. And it's not just vision casting, pep talk, slogan, slide presentation leadership. It's getting it done leadership. It's turning the screws and, and uh, turning vision into reality. And I go to so many places these days where people have caught on to the excitement of vision casting and people stand in front of their congregation and they say, you know, we're going to take the world. And I visit the church three years later. They haven't taken a block. You know, they haven't taken a neighbor. Um, this has got to, you know, this can't be. So some of you are saying, well, you're a couple years into this strategic plan. How are you doing? I asked Greg Hawkins yesterday, and I only bring some of these things to your attention as this is all praise be to God and as maybe an inspiration for some of you that things can change if you apply in a very spiritually anointed way the getting it done forms of leadership. Uh, when we started this plan two and a half years ago, uh, you know, in January, uh, from that point to this point, our weekend attendance is up 2,100. In the last two and a half years, our weekend average attendance is up 2,100. Several weekends we hit 18,000. Most weekends in the 17 somewhere. Small group participation has gone from 8,000 people to 13,800 people. 70% increase of people in small groups. New community has added uh, 1,200 people a week. Membership has gone up. Uh, 3,100 people have become members in this new system in the last couple years. Get this, this is one that really excites me. We have had a 354% increase in the number of Willow Creek people who are serving the poor. 
3,000 more people are serving the poor this year than ever before. And the uh, association uh, has had a 160% increase, added 2,200 churches to the vision of helping uh, lost people come to Christ through a local church around the world. Whenever I go through this, you know, I know there's some people in the peanut gallery and they're saying, uh, oh, so now you're into numbers. I want to take you on, if that's what you're thinking. <laughs> I mean, you don't scare me one bit because every number is a life. Every number is a heart. Every number is somebody. Lee Strobel stood up here, and he said, you know, that was my son who was baptized. And when I say that our weekend attendance has gone up 2,000, you know, the big number doesn't hit me as much as the names. And I'll give you the names right now. Howard and Cheryl and Mejan and Toon and Brian and Bill and Dave. Those are the people that I've brought to the church and who are coming to the weekend services now who weren't two and a half years ago. And they are people, names, faces, with eternities hanging in the balance. And you can bet your life, I'm dead serious about doing everything in my power to help our weekend, to help our value of evangelism go up. And when we talk about, you know, moving from one number to another number with small groups, there were 5,000 lonely, disconnected, uninvolved people who are now sitting around a circle, holding hands and praying with brother, brothers and sisters who care for them, with a Bible open, and they're studying God's Word, and they're being cared for, and they're being shepherded by a trained leader. 5,000 more people than two and a half years ago. And if that was your mom or your dad or your brother, your sister, your son, and your daughter, you'd be singing the Hallelujah Chorus. And it's the same thing with new community and membership and all the rest. Now, we're not completely finished with all this alignment stuff. We, there's more to align. There's so much more work to be done. We have to align some of our systems and processes on the administrative side of Willow so that they complement the new paradigm. We're aligning our information systems to be able to track our strategic plan progress. We're learning to, how to align our resources, our building usage, our staff hires, our office space, and our budgets around the strategic plan. And we still have to figure out how to connect compensation with all this. But I can tell you, that I feel so much better about what we're doing these days and who we're becoming together. And to see staff and lay leaders catch fire with all this and to sense the hunger in our church to reach the full redemptive potential of our church. We're not competing with anybody. You shouldn't be competing with anybody. All we're competing with is the redemptive potential of Willow. And that's what I want to you know, give my life to maximizing. Now I want to push the pause button right now because I feel it in the room. And um, I got to talk to you real openly about something here. Um, for five years now, in, in a real focused way, I've been giving talks all over the world on the spiritual gift of leadership. And I've been directing listeners' attention to the key New Testament verses on leadership, particularly Romans 12, 8, where Paul says, if you have the spiritual gift of leadership, you should lead, how does he say it? With all diligence. That was weak. Lead with all diligence. What does that mean to you? Deal with this, leaders. What does this mean to you? When God, through the Apostle Paul, says, I want you not just to lead. I want you to lead with all diligence. I think it means that every single leader in the kingdom should commit himself or herself to the full development of their leadership potential. I think it means that all of us leaders should be continually seeking to learn how we can lift our own leadership up to another level, even if that's excruciatingly difficult for us to do, even if it pulls us out of our comfort zones, even if we have to learn new disciplines, new skills, go back to school or whatever. I think it means we need to read and reflect and travel and receive training and look for mentors and be in a nonstop search for best practice wherever it's occurring in the kingdom of God and then humbling ourselves to learn from it and then challenging ourselves to apply best practice in an appropriate spirit-anointed way in our own leadership arena. Don't you agree? Don't you understand? I think you do. Those we lead can only go as far and fly as high as our leadership enables them. We leaders at some point must understand that we become the launchers or the limiters to those we lead. 
So like it or not, we have to stretch ourselves. I bring this up because in the past five years, I've had to stretch my leadership more than I thought I could. So many times, friends, I wanted to just vision cast. God's given me that ability. I can vision cast. Greg Hawkins and the other senior leaders around Willow, they kept pressing, they kept pressing, Bill, it's, there's more to it. I mean, we gotta, we gotta get down and get dirty. We've gotta do managing. We've gotta refine and set goals. And we've got to manage, and we've got to align, and we've got to have confrontations with staff, and we've got to measure stuff, and we've got to do the getting it done kind of leadership and not just give the sizzle talks. Well, so many times I wanted to just vision cast or I wanted to just go sailing or something instead of going through all of the morass of the kind of leadership that I'm talking to you about. But I'm far enough into the process now where I'm glad I didn't bail. And I know some of you right now, you know your leadership needs to be stretched. Uh, yeah, you can give the talk, you can say charge, but then you don't turn vision into reality. You, you don't, again, you don't get your hands dirty and really show up and lead and manage toward results. Some of the rest of you in this place are even having a deeper problem right now. You're experiencing a tinge of uneasiness on another matter. Some of you have wondered all throughout this particular talk, is strategic planning, is goal setting, are alignment exercises and efforts to increase the effectiveness of how the local church is managed, is this biblical? And some of you right now are saying, is this what the Holy Spirit had in mind on Pentecost Day when he blew life and power into the church and told it to reach the world? I mean, shouldn't we just let go and let the Holy Spirit rip and see what God does? Could it be that we're superimposing worldly business practices into a spiritual realm where it doesn't belong? Are we risking managing the Holy Spirit right out of His supernatural ministry in the church if we get just a little too leadership-oriented? Friends, this is an absolutely critical question that every one of you have to ask and answer. Where do you settle out on this? Now, it's easy to take a pot shot on someone. Where do you settle out on this? How seriously should we take leadership and management how seriously should we try to convert vision into reality in our local churches? Should we just dream and give pep talks, or should we manage for results? What do you think? I had to face this problem head on uh, some years ago, and I faced it in a unique set of circumstances. It was at the Harvard Business School when I was defending the Willow Creek case study that Jim Miotto put together under the leadership of Len Schlesinger, uh, a Harvard prof who I'm gonna interview right here on this stage tomorrow afternoon. But after seeing how much attention, Jim talked a lot about leadership in the case study, and I would go out and defend the case study in front of these Harvard Business School students. And after seeing how much attention we paid to leadership and management functions here at Willow, in one of the classes, one of the Harvard Business School students raised his hand, and he said, uh, Bill, I just don't think you should mix best management practices with spiritual stuff. He said, I'm really uneasy with all this leadership training, leadership development, management for results that I see it. Well, I'm uneasy with all this. He said, I think when it comes to God and the spiritual realm and church, it ought to be laissez-faire. It ought to be hands off. Let go and let God. Whatever will be, will be. Whatever happens, will happen. That's what I think. Well, that was on the spot. I mean, I had to, in that moment, respond to that. So I did. I said to that student, you know, I find it very interesting that you're here in one of the best schools in the history of education learning the very latest and greatest leadership and management disciplines so that you can graduate from here and join a company to help them set records manufacturing and selling widgets, soap, and software. That's necessary stuff. I understand that. But it's stuff that has no power to change a human life. It's got no power to change someone's destiny and no power to change the world. And I said to the student that day, what you have to understand is that some of us church leaders believe to the core of our beings that the local church is the hope of the world. We believe that. And we believe it because churches steward the transforming message of the love of Christ. It's the only agency in society that does that. Churches address the deepest need in the lives of human beings. Churches can lead people into a whole new way of living and loving and serving and transforming society. And you should know that some of us church leaders live with the ongoing daily reality that the eternal destinies of people in our communities hang in the balance. And therefore, it really does matter 
that our visions are right and that our values are lived out and that our strategies are effective and that our goals are attained and that our staff is aligned and its resources are leveraged. Because the success or failure of our churches directly affects people's lives here on earth and their eternal destiny in the next life. And we believe this to our toes and we take bullets for it. So I said to the student, we make no apology for learning and applying best practice principle as God leads us in our churches. How could we do otherwise? The church is the hope of the world. Now that's where I settle out on this, friends. That's a very deep personal conviction of mine. I've dreamed since I was a kid. I went to a church the whole time I was growing up. I don't want to just do a church bashing thing here because the church that I grew up in did some wonderful things. They preached the word of God and helped develop character and uh, family values and those kinds of things. But it, it, it was just doing laps. I went to that church. I left that church 25 years ago, went to a funeral there several months ago, and the same numbers on the wall, the highest Sunday school attendance they ever had was 76, record attendance. That hadn't changed in 25 years. There's 10,000 more people in the immediate community. Those numbers hadn't changed in 25 years. They've gone through a succession of pastors. People have not taken leadership seriously, vision casting seriously, proclamation of the gospel, staff alignment, any goals. It's just a mundane, you know, it's just, it's just plain church, my humble opinion. No. People want to do that and stand before a bloodstained Jesus Christ someday. Go do it. God gave me something I never asked for, I never deserved. He gave me this thing called the spiritual gift of leadership. And he gave orders with it. He said, you lead as diligently as you can learn how to lead. You maximize every ounce of leadership potential. You read, you study, you get mentored. In the last couple months, I've sat down with the former CEO of uh, Motorola, Bob Galvin, tremendous man. And I call him just, we had a mutual friend, and, and I said, Bob, you know, you're, you're retired now, you're still chairman of the board. And I said, I'm struggling trying to lead this church. And you're a very smart guy. Can I just get together with you once in a while and ask you questions about leadership? Absolutely, he said. We've spent many hours together. Um, I mean, I, all I'm saying is, I'm really serious. Learning from anybody, reading anything I can to improve my leadership to, so that there can be best practice here at Willow. Not for some perfectionistic paranoia control way, but because, you know why. Because the church matters. And I want all of you who are still wondering about this kind of thing to look at our own leader, Jesus Christ. Look how seriously he took his leadership challenge. When he was only 12 years old, he looked at his parents and, and he said to them, I must be about my father's business. Let the other kids read comic books and play Nintendo. I've got a world to change. And it's serious business. He called it a business. He said, it's my father's business. When he formally launched his ministry, he had a clear vision. He had a three-year strategic plan that included the selection and development of 12 disciples, a teaching ministry, a compassion ministry. He had a very well thought out evangelism strategy that was to move from concentric circles outward, first Judea, Samaria, and then the other uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus made specific assignments to his followers, job descriptions, if you will. And when his followers did them well, he commended them and praised them, rewarded them. When they didn't, he confronted them and showed them how to do it right and sent them out to do it again to prove themselves. Mark my words. Jesus was not laissez-faire about how the kingdom was going to spread. He had a plan, and he had a strategy, and he infused vision and turned vision into reality as he built into the disciples and ministered in a thoughtful, intentional way. Just before he ascended into heaven, he gave his followers a clear mission. He said, you preach the gospel to the lost all around the world. You disciple those who come to the faith, and then you build local churches to be so strong that the gates of hell cannot prevail against them. Those are... Our marching orders, friends. He made them clear to us. And of course, he said at the end of those marching orders, I'm going to help you. Oh, I'm going to help you. You don't have to do this alone. In a thousand ways, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you by my word, by my spirit, by my power, with the gifts that I give you, with my presence. I'm going to help you. But you've got to get about the Father's business in a real thoughtful, intentional, intelligent way. 
And so as I close this talk, I want to reflect back on the first talk and remind you of the power of vision. You see it, you feel it, you take responsible responsibility for it, and you cast it, and you get people to join you. And oh man, you paint that picture that produces passion in you and the followers. And then you transition into getting it done kind of leadership, where you fine tune what that vision is. You get a plan, and you set goals, and you align everybody around it and you encourage everybody to be on the same page and pull together. And when we all do that, friends, our churches are going to prevail. They're going to achieve vision. They're going to they're going to thrill the one who hung on the cross so that it would be so. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I don't know what to say. Sometimes I feel like I know what I'm doing and other times I feel I don't. But I, I do know I can be a better leader than I am today. And I know you say you'll help me. And I do know the local church is the hope of the world, and I do know that Willow Creek has more redemptive potential in it than I'm able right now to draw out of it, and I want to do better. So God, I, I don't mind asking you for help. Pray that you'll bring people into my life, that I'll read the right books, that I'll go the right places and be stimulated by the right kinds of thinking so that I can improve leadership around here that will bring you glory, bring people to faith and grow them up. But I do pray this on behalf of all the leaders sharing in this prayer. I pray that we will lead with all diligence that when we stand before you someday and give an account of our leadership, that we'll be able to look you right in the eyes and say, I did everything in my power to lead with every ounce of diligence that I could muster in the strength of your spirit. So God, grow us up in this. Mature our minds and hearts. And uh, we'll give you all the praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks.